is looking at reality and saying, look, John, you're fat. Uh, you're not going to be a rock star someday. You're not going to be a millionaire. Can It can happen, but you have to make it happen. I would start a lot of projects. I call it kind of the closet of broken dreams. Now, I now have this mindset of being a finisher. And whenever I start a project, I finish. I'll own it, right? I'll, I'll back off and say, you know, I could have said things in a better way, but I'm going to own. But I still stand by what I said, like even though the, the tone was not correct. Look out for yourself. Look out for the people that, that you need to protect and use the minimal amount of force and aggression as possible to accomplish that. Because anything else other than that is ego-based and it, it can just fuck you up. It, it doesn't help you in any way, right? The more powerful you are, the less you have to exhibit and display that power. Do you really want a woman to stick with you because you have a fucking job? Like, it's, it's so fucking pathetic to me. It's like, in my mind, I want the woman that's with me to think, this is the best fucking guy I could possibly get, right? I'm fucking lucky to have this guy. I'm not accepting a woman that doesn't appreciate me in that way. And that's how these guys need to start thinking to stop thinking victim mindset and start thinking, I'm gonna be so fucking good that any woman would be a fucking fool to not be with me. I, I'm not, I, she doesn't have to be with me because I make money and she can't get a job. That's fucking stupid. That, to me, that is just pathetic. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Deron Brown, and this is your host of A Podcast for Men. I have a very special guest. This is John Samez. This is somebody I've been following for about eight to nine years, ever since I was in my um, master's program in IT. Uh, I found John through his programming channel, a simple programmer, where he gave um, a plethora of different advice related to coding and life. And later that channel evolved into the bulldog mindset. You know, um, I've been a big fan of John, so I support him all throughout the journey. And um, there's so many things I can cover with John during this podcast. But I think the main thing that we're going to focus on is developing a bulldog mindset. John has evolved in multiple different areas of his life. He, uh, he, t he walks it how he talks it. And next to Andrew Tate, he's I can honestly say he's the only man within this manosphere, red pill or whatever you want to call it within this space that is encouraging man to become the best version of themselves. Now, John, can you give yourself a brief introduction? Well, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. For that yeah. introduction. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, basically, uh, like you said, I was a software developer, uh, ran a company called Simple Programmer. I still have that company. And, you know. I, on that path, I was teaching how to uh, soft skills, basically how to become a better software developer and to make more money and market yourself. And I got on the path of personal development from there. And then really, you know, into masculinity, right? Realizing that, you know, me, myself, as I was at the time, you know, 30 something, I didn't really feel like a man. Like I, I never, no one ever really taught me those things. And so as I was getting into that and learning those things myself, uh, I started teaching that and I got into Stoic philosophy a lot along that path as well. And so that's where Bulldog Mindset came from was this idea of getting rid of the victim mindset that so many people have. That's really the biggest thing that's holding people back in life and teaching men how to be men. I felt like there was a lack of true masculinity. People misunderstood that and men didn't understand how to achieve the goals that they want in life, whether it be the fitness goals, uh, getting getting uh, women and you know, in, in getting in shape, and then the financial side of things, become financially free, building business, all, all those things that uh, that most men want. They want all those things. And I had figured out a lot of those things myself. And so I started teaching those things. And that's what Bulldog Mindset is, is, you know, is my focus is really just teaching men how to become really the best version of themselves and to, uh, you know, to to be a, a man. Okay. Looking back at your journey, you talk about you, you're trying to get men out of the victim mindset. When you take a look at your own journey. Were you ever in the victim mindset? Because you said at your 30s, you didn't feel like a man when you hit 30. But Prior to being 30, did you feel like a victim? Did you have a oh me type of mentality? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, it I think at, at different stages, it was it was very deeper, right? Most of us, we really still do have the victim mindset to a degree, right? Some of us have rooted it out, but it's still kind of deep in there, myself included, right? There's times when I catch myself even today where I'm like, John, you're playing the victim here, right? You know, any anytime we're basically saying boo-hoo, right? And saying someone did this to me or this is not fair, we have the victim mindset, right? So now uh, when I was younger, I, I, I displayed it, uh, you know, all the time, right? I remember 
going to uh, to prom and not going with the girl that I wanted to and like hanging out with with the friend group and just like being visibly upset about, you know, and, and making it visible to, so that everyone could see it. Right. It's like, <laughs> but um, but yeah, but, you know, you know, I, I, I you know, I would get a, a bad hand dealt to me and I would complain about it and whine about it and blame other people. You know, and, uh, and and yeah, and and so that was that was something that, uh, and then I realized that that was something that was really holding me back in life is because unless you take full responsibility for your life and your circumstances, you don't have control, and that and that is the key piece of it. You know, a lot of times, say, well, you know, uh, I don't have the victim mindset. It's just you know things happen. Someone did this to me, and it's not my fault. Which which may be true. It's not your fault. A lot of times in life, right? If you, if you're driving down the road and someone rear ends you, it's not your fault. True. It's still your responsibility. So it doesn't really matter whose fault it is, right? Because you still got to deal with the problem. So the the idea of placing blame and figuring out whose fault it is that in itself is a victim mindset because it doesn't matter. Because what matters is that it's your life. You have to deal with it. You take responsibility, whether it's your fault or not. Isn't there a term like called maximum accountability? Something like that. I've heard you say something like that before. Am I am I saying it correctly? I think that yeah, I, I've I've heard that term. I, I'm trying to think what what I it was call like it. a book, I believe, or something. I remember you saying. Yeah, oh, that. It, there. It's. I think you're thinking of extreme. Uh, the the Jocko Willink yes. book. Uh, extreme leadership or extreme ownership. That's what it is. Extreme ownership. Okay. Yeah, which is yeah, basically the same concept. Yeah. What is the first step that you took? When it came to going from the victim mindset to the bulldog mindset, what's the very first thing that you did to help improve work, basically improve yourself? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that. I'm trying to think what was the first. I mean, it, it's hard to say. I think that I would say the first thing that I did was I had an awakening where I realized that, you know, it's. I did a video on this a while back ago and simple programmer talking about how everyone thinks they're going to be a rock star someday right it's mm -hmm. like we have this delusion in our head that someday we're going to get the girl someday we're going to get the car someday we're going to be famous right we're going to make money and i had that delusion just like most people did and i at that point in my life i think this was probably when i was like maybe 28 or so uh i had bought some i went to the store to buy some size 46 pants because my size 44 pants didn't fit me and i was like you're fat, John, <laughs> right? Like there was no denying before I was like, oh, yeah, just a little chubby or whatever. I got a little bit of a something, you know, yeah. I had this, you know, this delusion in my head. And so the first step for me, I, I would say overcoming the victim mindset and, and getting down that road of, of developing the bulldogs mindset was uh, accepting reality, right? Not sugarcoating, just looking at reality and saying, look, John, you're fat. Uh, you're not going to be a rock star someday. You're not going to be a millionaire. It's not going to happen. Unless you make it happen, it can it can happen, but you have to make it happen, right? You, mm -hmm. You're not going to get girls and all this stuff. That you're not better than them. That you're not, you know, it, it's not that uh, that you know you're you're just it's just not a convenient time. It's it's that you're a coward, that you're you're chicken, that you're not developing yourself as you could. So I think the the very first step for me at least was accountability, was acceptance of the true reality of you know wanting to really see things as they are, not as I wanted them to be. And I think that's that's a really hard thing for people to do because it's painful. Because when you see things how they really are. It means that you fucked up somewhere and you've got to make some changes in your life and you got to take responsibility. So that's the very first thing. Because, see, you can't take responsibility, which is the opposite of the victim mindset, until you have acceptance, until you truly see things and want to see things how they are. Then you can take responsibility. So once you took responsibility and you started your weight loss journey, mm -hmm. during that time, were you already a millionaire? Were you a millionaire or were you overweight? No, no, I wasn't. I was not. Uh, it it was, I would say from, because it was about 28. Okay. Now I had some properties. I had bought some rental properties, right? Uh, okay. I I had had been investing and I was doing well as, in terms of my software development career. I was making you know, six-figure income at the time, but I was nowhere close to being a millionaire. Within the five-year time span, that's where from 28 to 33, that's when I became financially free. I became a multimillionaire at 33 and and became financially free, quit my job. I was ripped at that point, you know, yeah. had lost the weight 
right, had had changed in so many different ways. That is amazing the amount of transformation that happened in that in that period. But it all started with that catalyst of accepting responsibility and, and wanting to see the truth. Okay, so can you tell, discuss how you went from being working a nine to five to becoming financially free? Because you start off this fat guy, you lost yeah. the weight, and in a matter of four years or three or four years, you you became financially free. So how, how did that process happen? Yeah, so there were a few things that were going on there, right? So one of them was that I already had a good investing plan set up, which was buying real estate. Okay. I bought my first house when I was 19 years old. Now, not because I was smart, because I didn't want to pay rent. And I thought I should be able to buy a house. So I bought a kind of a shack of a house. And then a few years later, when I figured out to start investing in real estate, so I started buying one property every year. All right. And a lot of people, they're like, oh, yeah, well, that's, you know, sure, you've got the money to do that. I didn't have the money to do that. I was putting 10% down on $100,000 house you know i was basically scrimping and saving 10 grand per uh per year a lot of people that complain about that they could actually do that right because i get that all the time and i'm like no it, it required a lot of sacrifice to do it but i did do that okay now what 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 really changed and accelerated that transformation in that five-year period was one of the biggest things was i became what i call a finisher right so up until that point in time I would start a lot of projects. I call it kind of the closet of broken dreams where you have you know, soccer cleats for when you're going to play soccer and your guitar and a novel you half wrote or whatever, it really didn't even half write a quarter wrote or wrote one chapter, you know, whatever it is, you know, all these things that you, you plan on doing, but you never completed. That was me. I started all these projects, side hustles, all this kind of stuff. But I remember that year, I also started this Android application called Pacemaker was this running application uh, for my phone that would track my pace. And it was really, really difficult, but I decided I was going to finish that. And so I finished that, that application. And that was fundamental because at that point, it, it now I now had this mindset of being a finisher. And whenever I start a project, I finished it. So I did a lot of different projects, including setting up my blog and, and getting writing blog posts consistently on there on Simple Programmer. And then I got an opportunity with a company called Pluralsight to produce developer courses for them. And I saw this opportunity. And I started running with it, right? A lot of developers that were authors on that on that program or that platform, they would create one or two courses and then and then be done. But I said, no, no, I'm going to create the most courses of anyone on this platform because it guarantees that I'm going to be successful if I do that. And so I just started creating course after course. I ended up creating something like 50 courses over the next three years. Okay. So that opportunity. Then I took a lot of that money that I was making from uh, Pluralsight. I started getting paid royalties on that. And I started putting that into paying off the real estate that I had and buying new real estate. And then uh, I was also building up my business at the time, Simple Programmer. So I took that blog and I, I, I kept on writing on it. I gained traffic and I, I started learning some internet marketing. Right, So I created an email list. I launched my first product called How to Market Yourself as a Software Developer. And I sold that for originally like pre-sold it for $75, but then sold it for uh, around $300. And in one weekend, all of a sudden I made like 25 grand from selling this course. And I was like, okay, wow, this is crazy that I, I could do this. And I realized that this blog could become a business. And so I started investing my time in actually creating good business processes around that, creating an email list, selling products through that at the same time I was doing the post site courses and then paying off the real estate. So all of those things in conjunction ended up getting me to a point where I had a passive income goal. I knew that if I could make $6,000 a month passively, then I could be financially free and essentially retire. And that, and I hit that goal uh, around February 14th, 2013. Okay, so I have a few questions. Before I get into the plural side questions, you said that you were selling a course for 75 bucks and then you upped it to $300. Like, um, what were you making when it was $75 compared to $300? And then what was the major change that actually brought those people in and actually allowed you to get those sales? Yeah, so actually, when I sold it for $75, I hadn't even built the course yet. It was a pre-sale. In fact, I belonged to this entrepreneur mastermind that we still do. It was called Entre Programmers at the time. And we did this 24-hour entrepreneur challenge, right? So this idea was you're dropped in the wilderness with a knife and that's it, right? Like go and kill something, right? Go make some money. So the idea was you have 24 hours, okay? You have to make 
a hundred dollars in 24 hours. You can't use your own email list. You can't use your website. You can't use anything. You just have the internet, go make at least a hundred dollars. Right. And so, and the goal, the goal was to make as much money as you could. And so I came up with the idea. I was like, well, I, you know, I, I've been thinking about making a course on marketing yourself as a software developer. So I ended up writing up, uh, a, I created a new website. Uh, I think it was, I can't remember the, um, I can't remember the name of it now, but anyway, I, I wrote an article on there about um, glass ceiling for software developers and how marketing yourself as a software developer could increase your your salary like a rock star or a famous cook. And I submit to Hacker News and it, it blew up on Hacker News. So I got a bunch of traffic from that. And then I started going on all kinds of f- uh, forums and, and Google groups and stuff like that and advertising it. And my goal was just to, to sell this thing. I created a sales page for this, wrote the copy for it, wrote a little book in that time that I was, I was giving away as kind of a lead magnet. And I did all this in kind of 24 hours. And, uh, and, and basically wow. I sold it, pre-sold it for just 75 bucks. So I didn't, I didn't know what anyone would pay for. I was like, even mm-hmm. $75 seemed like a high amount. Right. So I only sold like, I think like six or seven of those, right. Which, I, you know, I, I won the competition because I think that the next place someone had made a hundred or two hundred dollars, and then, uh, but then I realized I was like, well, you know, if if I could do this in twenty four hours and like six or seven people will buy this, then I could sell this thing for three hundred dollars to my actual audience, and they'll definitely buy this thing. And so, and and again, I wasn't I wasn't as sure as I'm sounding now, right? I was still mm-hmm. I remember when I first launched it and sent the emails out launching this product the real product for $300, um, I sat there and I waited for, you know, after I, I sent the emails out and I waited, you know, half an hour and no, nothing came in. I was like, Oh crap, nothing's going to happen. And then all of a sudden one sale came in for $300. I was like, okay, wow. Well, okay. And then, you know, another sale came in, another sale came in. And then I remember sitting at dinner that night uh, and just looking at my phone and watching sale, come in, sale, come in, sale, come in, sale, come in. And I was like, okay, this is, this is working. Man, that's crazy. You said you made that in one day. You already started getting sales. You got seven sales that put it up to about, so you made about 500 bucks? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, and then you made, and then you said, okay, I'm going to improve it. Well, improve, increase the price to $300, and then you sold it to your simple programming students, correct? Exactly. And at the, at the point when I had sold it for 75 mm-hmm. I hadn't even built it yet. I just pre-sold the idea of it, right? Just oh, to test it to see, right? And yeah. then, and then once I had gotten that money, I was like, "Oh, well, I better build the thing now." And so I built it, and 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 so, in fact, a lot of the best stuff that I've ever done has has been done that way, where I built it after I had gotten paid for it, because then it okay. it, for, it put you on the hook, like you got to do it now. Yeah. All right. I, want, I have another question. So, how many courses did you make with uh, Pluralsight? I think it ended up being like fifty something. 50, I don't know, 50 something. 50 something. And were you a yeah. part of like when, were you a part of Pluralsight when it was first launched? Not when it was first launched. I was pretty early on. There was a point in Pluralsight's history where I had more than 50% of the courses on the platform were courses I created, okay. right? Okay. I was probably maybe two years into Pluralsight after it had had started. I got in, invited to a friend of mine, David Starr, was uh, I was actually speaking at uh, at Boise, Idaho Code Camp, and he saw me speaking there on Android development, and he had said, oh, "Hey, we need someone to do an Android course at Pluralsight." Okay, that worked out. How yeah. how long did it take you to make all those courses? Well, at first, I was producing a course every two to three months, or I'd say every two months, and then I got it down to a system after I quit my regular job and I just started working on Pluralsight courses where I was creating a new course uh, pretty much every, every two weeks, uh, one and a half weeks, I would create a course. So uh, in one year I did 36 courses. So it took me, all those courses were created over the course of three years, basically. Okay. And how much were you getting all those courses like yearly? Would you say? Oh, it, it, it became an insane amount. So the very first course that I did, I remember, at that point with Pluralsight, the way that it worked was if you had over seven hours of course content in their library, they would pay you royalty, but they wouldn't pay you any royalty until you had that. Otherwise, they just paid you a commission on the on the course, right? So I think for that first Android course that I created, I made sure it was over seven hours because it was already like 
going to be close to that. So I was like, okay, might as well make it longer and make it over seven hours. And they paid me a commission. I think it was like five grand to make this course, which, which again, just getting five grand to make the course. I was like, okay, that's a pretty good deal. I mean, that's not bad, you know, for, for, for developing this, this course, get paid five grand. But then I got a royalty check uh, a few months later, my first royalty check and my first royalty check was five grand. And this is a quarterly royalty check for every three months. So I was like, holy crap, this is insane. I was like, this is, <laughs> I, I did this one course one time. I got paid five grand. I just got paid five grand again on it. And next quarter, I'll probably get paid five grand or more on it as more people watch the course, right? This is insane. So I said, all right, I'm going to start. I start. I started my next course. I said, oh, hey, how about an iOS course? They're like, do you know how to code iOS? I'm like, nope. Not yet, but I will learn it and I will create a course on it. So I did. I created an iOS course. I created an IOC course. I, you know, I, I just started. I said, what do you guys need? I'll start. I'll, I'll learn it. I'll create a course on it. And so I got to a point where, uh, you know, I, I think my next royalty check was something like eight grand. And then the next royalty check was like 15 grand. Right. These are every three months. And I was getting paid to make the courses as well. And uh, eventually I got to a point where I think the biggest royalty check I, I got, I was getting 150 grand royalty checks every three months uh, from, from, from plural sites. So that was, that was probably the biggest. And then, you know, it started to go down after that. Uh, but, but yeah, at the, at the height that was, was around, you know, the, the biggest Man, I was making. So that's some nice real estate cash. You know, that's yeah. all, that's what I've been thinking about lately. Yeah. So what, what happened with your relationship with plural site? I mean, you know, I've been following you for years. I've heard that I heard because of like a Twitter or something, something you posted on Twitter ruined your relationship with Pluralsight. I don't know all the details. I'm not a Twitter yeah. guy, but could you explain what that what that was all about? Yeah. So there's a couple of things. So one, the, the very first thing was I stopped making courses for them, not because of any kind of relationship issues or anything, but because I read a book by 50 Cent and Robert Green called The 50th Law. And then that book, he was talking about uh, owning your own corner. Now he was talking about dealing drugs, but he was, but the lesson in there was like, you need to own your own corner, right? There's a story about where he went to jail and he came back and he, he had to work from the bottom of the drug dealing business because he didn't own the corner. The other guy owned the corner. Right. And so it was like, own your own corner. And I realized I was like, okay, I'm making a lot of money from plural site. Right. But it's like, it's almost like the same thing. It's almost like, you know, I'm working for a drug dealer. I don't own the corner. They own the corner. Okay. So I got to, I got a cowtail to them. Right. And so, you know, they could shut me off. They could do whatever they're in control of me because they're, they're making me the money. So, uh, so, so I said, all right, I'm going to stop doing plural site courses and I'm going to work on simple program, but that's my corner. I own that. And I built that up. Eventually I built that up to a point where I was making more than my plural site courses, uh, on, on simple programmer because I was doing about, uh, at the highest 70 to 80,000, uh, a month on, on a simple programmer. So, um, yeah, so, so what, what ended up happening though, was that was the first thing that happened. So I stopped kind of doing courses for them and I was still getting royalties and residual checks from them. But then uh, I had this one, you know, and, and this was not, you know, the best way to handle things, but there was this, this girl that was on my podcast, I had this podcast, get up and code, uh, Amy Knight. She was, you know, a new developer and stuff. Really, really nice person. Uh, it was a figure skater or whatever. And, uh, and I remember, you know, she was just really, really cool, nice person, like, you know, just uh, very helpful to everyone else. And, uh, and, and I was, you know, kind of minding my own business. And one of my friends messaged me and he's like, do you see what's happening to Amy on Twitter? Right. And so I was like, OK, you know, let me go and check it out. And there was this whole, you know, I mean, you know, the tech industry, very political, correct, politically correct. Right. There's this whole kind of social justice thing just took over the tech industry, right? And so she said something, I can't remember exactly what she said on Twitter, but she said some kind of innocuous comment about um, about about something about uh, uh, adversity or, or you know, our um, uh, privilege or something like that. And, you know, these, these, these people who specialize in stirring up hate on Twitter, I mean, literally, they, they're you know, hashtag like, you know, make a ruckus, right? Start attacking her and trying to basically cancel her, right? And, and screw up her career. And I thought to myself, I'm like, you know what? See, this is the kind of person that they can bully around, but they can't bully me because guess what? I'm my own man and I own my own income stream and I don't have a boss. You can't fire me, right? So I was like, 
fuck it. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to blast their asses. Right. So I just started calling them all kinds of names and blasting them. Right. And then, you know, and then we got into the whole like social justice war, you know, battle on on twitter and i was saying you know this is ridiculous I'm victim you know i'm always against a victim mindset and i was like you can't use this as an excuse and they're all trying to you know say all these things and then they take all of the tweets that i posted out of context create a nice little collection of them and make me look racist and oh, that's what <laughs> right <laughs> right and i'm like damn and it, but I, on, on one hand i'm like fuck like it's like stupid like i was dumb because i let that happen it, it's almost like kind of like the the andrew tate like taking the clips out of context and stuff and making it yeah. work. like you know it's, it's kind of a similar thing you know but it was my stupidity mm-hmm. because damn like you shouldn't say stuff that people can use against you and yeah. you know and so after that happened uh, you know, it just got spread all over the place. And, and again, there's professionals on Twitter that literally their job is to to cause these kind of disruptive uh, things and cancel people. Right. That's literally what they what they do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they sent it out everywhere. And so then, you know, Pluralsight calls me up and they're like, hey, you know, we're you know, we saw the thing. And, you know, they, uh, and I was friends with the CEO, Aaron Sconard. And, you know, we got on the call and everything and they're like, you know, you need to apologize and back off your statements. And like, and I was like, no, I'm not. And they're like, we're, we're going to we're going to kill your royalties. We're going to pull your courses. And I was like, you know, you got to do what you got to do. But like, you know, you, you're 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 defending people who are social justice mm-hmm. warriors who are completely ruining the tech industry and who are actually the racists, right? It's not, you know, they're the ones who are the, the maybe not even racist, but bigots. They're bigots, right? Because they have prejudice and they're trying to attack people that they don't like, and and you're you're perpetuating that. I'm not going to apologize to them, you know, mm-hmm. uh, for for that. And and I also know that making a public apology like that is an admittance of guilt, right? And that's yeah. you know, you're going to get it's it's never the right move, right? You have to own what you did. And so I was like, I'll own I'll own it, right? I'll I'll back off and say, you know, I could have said things in a better way, but I'm going to own. But I still stand by what I said, like even though the, the tone was not correct. And they're like, no. And I was like, all right. I like I'll, I'll take the consequences then I'm going to okay. I'm going to take the consequences for my action. So and at that point, I mean, they were paying me a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Right. So okay. but I was like, no, yeah. but I'm not. My integrity is worth more than than that. Um, and then my book publisher called me up, too. And they're like, all right, we're unpublishing oh. your book. Right. Same same thing. They want me to apologize. I'm like, no, I'm not. Is doing this it. a simple programmer book that you had? This was yeah, it was uh, software developers life manual. This was Manning, at, you know, at the time. Oh, okay. and, and I told Manning, I was like, look, like same thing here. Like you're going to throw me under the bus. Right. And, you know, you're going to because you're afraid of these people. I'm like, you know, you make your choice. That's fine. Right. I said, But right. the thing with Manning, too, is I told him, I was like, look, I just tried to buy the rights for my book because it was published by them and they didn't want to do a Kindle version of the book. Right. And so I offered them one hundred thousand dollars to buy the rights to my book and then I would self publish it so I could do a Kindle version. And they said mm-hmm. no. And now they gave it back to me for free. So I was like, okay, I'll take, <laughs> I'll take okay. it. So I self-published it. I, it's published out there on a- Amazon now, and I made, you know, I made more money than I ever made with it, getting ten percent share, and I get a hundred percent share of the book. So, um, so that that ended up working. I mean, it took me some work to rewrite the book and to publish it again, and and all that stuff. But yeah, but that's basically what happened. But I mean, you know, as much as it's like cool that I stood up to the, it wasn't. It still wasn't a smart decision because. I didn't really gain anything from it, it but yeah. it cost me, right? It's like, you know, when I looked at the time, I was like, yeah, you know, fuck this, you know, fuck <laughs> them, right? And, and you know, fine. You know, and yeah. obviously, like, it just goes to prove that you do not have free speech unless you're financially free, right? I mean, technically, I had don't. free speech. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, still don't. <laughs> you don't have the consequences that, like, if you have yeah. your own money, like, then, yeah, people can cancel you and whatever, but they can't. If you have a job, if you have an employer, they can screw you over, right? Because they, they, they're okay. in control of that, right? So, you know, you have a lot more, let's say, a, a lot more freedom uh, to speak your mind if you're financially free. But if you don't, if you're not financially free, you don't have any almost, you know. You kind of already uh, answered this, but I want to know, like, why were you so adamant about not apologizing? Like, what was going on inside of you to not apologize? And then also, if you can go back, would you, handle things differently i'm sure you would still express yourself but would you have done things a little differently yeah so good question so ne- I, I my philosophy is never apologize as a man right now okay. again people misunderstand that okay 
if I really fuck up, like hurt someone that I that I care about, did something totally wrong to them, I'm going to apologize. But the way that it's the real apology is this mm -hmm. is is acknowledging what you did, how it made the other person feel, uh, saying that you're not going to do it again and then rectifying the situation. Right. If you don't have those three elements, it's not a real apology. So. Uh, in, in the case of, you know, when I say don't apologize, I mean, do not apologize out of uh, out of fear, out of threat. Right. Uh, in order to escape your consequences, because that's not a true apology and it, it's weakness. Right. As men, men too much, too, too many times apologize way too much. Right. You bump into someone. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This you get in someone's way. I'm sorry. Uh, I hear it all the time. You know, pussy guys that apologize all the time and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They're just so, so used to saying I'm sorry. I, I, as a as a uh, as a rule, I don't apologize. OK, I own I'd rather own my actions. And then if you look at historically, right, with all the cancellations and all the, the kind of social justice crap that's gone on. The people who apologize get it the worst. Okay, it, it's you know uh, I remember when Uber right, when Travis the Uber Uber CEO when he had that whole fiasco going on if you remember that, and I remember I was like, damn, this guy needs to not apologize. All he needs to do is own it and just just say, yeah, I did that. It probably wasn't the smartest thing, but I did it right because that's who I am, right? And that's the thing I think about when it comes to apology is. You know, apology is like kind of like saying I made a mistake. Like that's not that was an accident, right? Apologies are for accidents, right? In, in in that case, I didn't make a mistake. I did what I intended to do, and so I own the consequences for that. For me to apologize and try to backtrack that, that's just saying most of the time when we're apologizing like that, we're saying I don't want the consequences for my action. It's not a true apology, okay? Because we're not really sorry about what we did. We we just don't want to you know, to suffer the consequences. And in most cases, people don't even want an apology. What they want is a rectification of the situation, right? So if I harm someone, if I do something to someone, I don't immediately seek to apologize. I immediately seek to make it right. That's, that's, that's a true, that's better than an apology. And so, um, so yeah, so that's kind of my, my general uh, take on, on the apology thing. But now, as far as going back, like if I could do things over, what would I have done? I would have just stayed out of it. It's none of my business. It doesn't matter. I, I realized, you know, later in life, you know, now that you don't have to have an opinion on everything. And a lot of times it's just better to keep your mouth shut and not say anything at all because there, there's no benefit to it. Like, what are you doing? Especially, you know, uh, I just did a video on Instagram when I was talking about uh, where I was talking about how. I, I did this this reel where this girl, I, I, you know, in, in the video, I was like, okay, what if she's looking at her phone and you're on a date, right? And I said, okay, you know, the first time you say, hey, is there something important on your phone? I just see, keep, see you keep on looking at it. Is there something important going on, right? Do you need a minute or something? And then she, no, no, no. And she pulls out again. I'm like, okay, well, you know, is there something something going on with your phone? Because it just seems like you're looking at your your phone a lot, right? Yeah. And then yeah. uh, and then you know, and then I walked out in the skit, and I was like, I was like, oh. Well, you know what? I, I think um, I think that uh, that this is going to work out or whatever. You know, have a good night. And then I, I took the money and put it on the table to pay for the day. And, and guys freaked out. And they're like, what? You should only pay for your half or you should stick her with the bill. She was being rude and looking on her phone. I was like, why are you going to pay for her and teach her it and, and reinforce her bad behavior? Yeah. And my whole response to that was, I'm not here to teach anyone a lesson. And see, that was a piece of wisdom that I lacked back then, which is, and I realized that this mm. is an extremely valuable piece of wisdom is don't try and teach people lessons. It, it, it's the same thing, you know, someone cuts you off in traffic. You're like, oh, I'm going to tailgate this guy and then fuck him up. Why? Are you actually going to teach him? How is that going to help you in your life? by teaching him a lesson, right? Is he even going to learn a lesson? It's not going to matter. Again, you go on a date with a girl, she's rude. And so you, you stick her with the bill or whatever. Good job. Have you really taught her yeah. a lesson? Is she really going to be like, all right, I'm never going to do that to a guy again. And even if she did, how does it benefit you? It doesn't matter. Like it's not my yeah. job to teach people lessons, right? Teaching mm -hmm. people lessons, it can get you killed. It can get you, it can get you <laughs> fucked up. It's not a good idea, right? So that that was the thing is like I was trying to teach these people a lesson online, right? And that and and that's just dumb. It's there's no point in doing that, right? Look out for yourself. Look out for the people that that you need to protect and use the minimal amount of force and aggression as possible to accomplish that. Because anything else other than that is ego based, 
and it, it can just fuck you up. It, it doesn't help yeah. you in any way. And so that that's what you know. That's what I would have done differently. Is not try and teach anyone a lesson. It's not my job, and, and it should, it's no one's job, right? Let let their parents teach them a lesson. You don't need to teach them a lesson. That comes with um, a lot of experience, maturity, and wisdom. You know, I kind of went through something similar my myself, and when I was going through, it, I was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna get them back. I'm gonna get them back. But then I realized it was taking energy from me. It was making me sick just right. even thinking about it. You know. And it, it was better for me to just focus on what I've been doing, you know, um, so I get that. I want to get because we're on this topic and you're speaking out against like uh, you're speaking out against like a, a mob of uh, Twitter, you know, Twitter people or whatnot. Andrew Tate has been doing something similar on the Internet. And um, some of it, some a lot of his stuff that he says, I agree with, honestly. Right. Um, but it's pretty obvious that he's going out of his way to. um be seen to to make his opinion heard um what are your thoughts on all this like andrew because he's all over the place what are your thoughts on this yeah. thing right now yeah yeah no i i know andrew tate personally you know i've had him on yeah. my my podcast and stuff and and yeah. you know i think he's a great guy i think he has a lot of wisdom i think he's a really smart yeah. guy i think a lot of what he says makes a lot of sense right i agree with with a huge amount of what he says right even though it's a lot of it's unpopular but i think if you really listen to what he's saying He's not sexist. He's not racist. He's not any of the things that people call him. All right. It, it, you know, but with that said, he made this long apology video, right? Not apology video. Sorry. Uh, he made a video where when he got first canceled, where he sort of explained himself and was like, all right. And he was like, you know, I'm going to conduct myself. I didn't realize that because I have this many followers that people are going to take what I'm saying literally and they're going to cut it up. And I have a sort of responsibility to the public and to these young men that are following me to make sure that I represent myself in the correct way, not in a way that you might if you have a smaller audience. OK, and that and that was like an hour and a half long video. It was really good. OK, he's not following what he said right now. OK, again, I love you, Andrew. You know, I'm not trying to knock you, but but I got to tell I got to call you out because we're <laughs> brothers would call call each other out. He's not following that. Right. Because he's okay. he's kicking the bees nest right now. Right. And, and a good example of it where this is the don't teach people a lesson thing. Yeah. What happened that uh, that one crazy climate chick uh said something. Right. And I can't remember what her what name was it like was. the American chick that was there and said that she was uh, held hostage or something like that while she was getting pizza or something like that. No, well, no, there was this um, Greta Thurman. Oh, Thurman. yeah. I had to right. I forgot who she was. But I had to look. I yeah. Know what you're talking about. The environmentalist girl, you know, the how dare you, you know, that girl. Right? So she said something on Twitter. Right. And Andrew Tate is like going back and forth with her on there. And he was like, he was like, you know, I have 35 cars and, you know, you know, all talking about all the gas and emissions and stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, and then he posted a video of him. Uh, taking a pizza box and he said, I'm not recycling this. Right. And oh. <laughs> when he posted that video on the internet, what happened was that that pizza box had a Romanian pizza company in there and the, the Romanian police were waiting for him to be back in the country. And because they saw that pizza box, they knew he was back in the country and then they went over there and arrested him. Okay. Now I don't know if the charges, I, I don't know anything about the charges or whatever, but it was just a good example of Trump, don't try to teach people a lesson and don't like because he he's kind of screwed himself over right because he was trying to get at her and by doing so he tipped off where he was and got himself in trouble and you know and, and caused himself it, it, it did no good for him right you know so th so that's where it comes from and i was just thinking about this the other day i was like you know if i'm in andrew tate's position and again i no don't don't get me wrong again i like the guy i like what he has to say yeah you know this is it. just my, my thoughts on this, which is that if I were in his position, okay, I understand the idea of it's good that he's teaching young men a message. You know, it, it's good, right? I, I think some of the behavior examples are not are not the best, right, to, to follow. But a lot of what he has to say is very, very true about masculinity and 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 society and, and things like that and escaping the matrix. I agree. So that so that's a powerful message. But if I'm him, right, and I'm and I just was making, you know, I'm making $10 million a month from hustlers university and, and all this stuff. And he's probably making more than that. Right. I'm just yeah. disappearing and no one's ever seeing me again. Cause I, <laughs> yeah, he, cause I think he was making 90 million a month with that. Yeah. Thing. That I'm done. 
I'm not I'm not fucking around because there's plenty of people that want to take see that it's it's the problem. And I think Andrew would agree with this. You know, we'll see if he ever hears it. But is that you have everything to lose and the people you're attacking have nothing to lose. Right. Because if you're going on Twitter and you're saying all this stuff that pisses people off at this point, you're making 90 million dollars a month someone's going to find some shit on you. Someone's going to fall to you. Yeah. Someone can take you down. Like you have a lot at risk. They have yeah. nothing at risk. Right. And so it's not a smart battle to fight in that case. Right. It'd be better to either just shut up and disappear with your money and be like, all right, cool. You know, you guys have fun, but I'm, I'm piecing out or to just toe the line and, and make sure that, yeah, you can still give your message, but don't kick the business. Don't purposely go out of your way to piss people off who will then have nothing to lose and come after you and devote their whole life to destroying you. And if there's enough people doing that, they're going to succeed at it. That's, you know, that's, that would be the thing that I would say about what he's, he's doing yeah. right now. It, it's, it's incongruent with the message that he gave uh, because he got his platform back. And so that kind of left the bad taste in my mouth. I'm like, eh, you know, that's not, not so good. Cause I really, yeah. you know, I, I was pointing people to that video. I was like, you know, you guys hate Andrew Tate, watch this video. Right. And they're like, oh yeah, no, that he's, I understand now. And now he's doing the opposite of what he said. I'm like, I don't know. That's, you know, again, it doesn't detract from his message because his wisdom is still what it is. But, you know, I, I think that he's making a mistake right now. Um, I would have to agree. You know, I'm a big fan of Andrew Tate. I'm a big supporter of Andrew Tate. But the thing I just couldn't figure out, I was like, man, this dude, he he fulfilled his purpose. He wanted to become right. internet famous. He did it in three months. He was right. making $90 million a month. He had all that attention. He could have just chilled out, right. went back, had a few podcasts, show his face every now and then. But um, it's like he went above and beyond to be, to get basically destroyed, you yeah. know, and um. I just I didn't I didn't really fully understand what he was trying to do. I think he even I think he even has his own bank. He was talking about that on the internet about how he has his own bank. And I'm like, man, why would you even say that? You know, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. But um, but back, I want to get back into um the bulldog mindset. Why did you change your channel from simple programmer to the bulldog mindset? Yeah, because you know. Basically, my whole presence on the internet has always been a reflection of who I am at the time, like in my own personal development and growth, right? That, that's what it's always been. And so at the time when I was a, a programmer, you know, simple programmer made sense. I was teaching programming. I was learning programming. That was what I was about. But after I quit my job and I stopped writing code and I was still running simple programmer, I really didn't have much to do with programming anymore. I met my last kind of thing was I wrote the complete software developer career guide, you know, that big tome because I wanted to take all the knowledge I had from software development and write it down before I lost it because that was kind of my final thing. Right. And so uh, I was also noticing a lot of my audience from some program, a lot of programmers were attracted to, uh, to my message because I was this jacked buff guy that didn't look like a programmer and, they wanted to do that too. And they, and a lot of the messages I was getting from guys were they're having trouble with women and, you know, all these long, you know, sob stories, five page sob stories about some girl they liked and had a crush on and stuff like that. And so I knew how to deal with those problems. And so that's why I made the transformation. A lot of people on my YouTube channel and simple programmer at the time were saying, how do I get that bulldog mindset that you have? And so that stuck with me. I was like, okay, people are saying it's a bulldog mindset. So let's, let's change the channel to bulldog mindset. And then that kind of freed me up because then I could really talk about whatever I wanted. That was what I was going through in life. And, you know, at that point I was just really on my path of personal development of running marathons, getting in shape, you know, building up my business, going out and, and dating women and, and learning, learning those skills. And so that's, you know, that's kind of how that transformation occurred. I want to know, we were just talking about Andrew Tate and how he's a, an, an advocate for uh, masculinity. What does masculinity mean to you? Because a lot of your videos recently have been about manhood, masculinity, having willpower, pushing yourself. How would you define masculinity? Yeah, it's 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 kind of a tough thing to define, right? There's different, I think there's different ways you can look at it and different angles you can view it from. And so I'll give you kind of a few different ones, right? So masculinity, I think at its core, is is doing what you want to do, trusting in your own judgment as a man, 
and accepting the consequences for your actions. That is that is really the key characteristic if I said what makes a man a man is that he doesn't pay attention to other people. He uses his own judgment to guide him. That's really what a leader does. And then accepts the full consequences for whatever action that he takes. Doesn't blame it on others. Doesn't try to get out of it. Accepts those things, right? I think that's that's really the key part of it. Now, if we look at like masculine, like what does it look like, right? What's a masculine man? Well, you know, masculine looks at like being hard. It looks like being stoic. It looks like uh, breaking through barriers, right? It looks like being assertive. It looks like being dominant, right? But I think there's a, another another aspect to it that we don't see as much, which it also looks like using controlled force, which we could call being gentle to a degree, right? It looks like uh, being kind, right? It looks like, uh, you know, a, a lot of these, these attributes that maybe I think more people would identify with being a gentleman, right? Is, yeah. is that's, that's a true masculinity. Because if you think about it, it you know, and, and this is where, where I kind of take some of these examples is if you think about the most powerful person right so think about a powerful king okay because that that's kind of really like the king figure is really the masculine figure right or, mm. or we think of the lion right the king of the jungle right the you know the, we think of that that figure but if you think of a powerful king does a powerful king get angry no what why he doesn't need to get angry why because he's all powerful because he can just have someone kill he doesn't need to be angry at them he just he just executes his plan without without emotion right he doesn't he doesn't react from his emotion right someone who reacts from emotion is very unmasculine right the the powerful king wh what do you think about this person you think that they don't have anything to prove right they don't they don't have to take revenge they don't have to so they're kind they're generous to other people right they're they're understanding they're they're gentle right we think of those things speak why it comes from power right the more powerful you are the less you have to exhibit and display that power, right? And so, you know, when, when I think about masculinity, I'm thinking about what would an extremely powerful king do or the or a powerful god, you know what I mean? A, a Greek god. Like, if you think about what would someone who has absolute power do, right? And the more power they have, the more they're going to act in the, in that way. Because that's really what, when you think about, you know, the masculine and the feminine, the feminine, the masculine is is the power, dynamic mm -hmm. right and and so that's kind of how how i think uh and, and view masculinity okay how do you feel about the current state of american culture there's a lot of guys obviously all over youtube that are complaining about women we need to go back to the 1950s go back to tradition you know etc what are your what is your stance on current America? You know, I know it's like a, a broad question, but I, yeah. I have another question to follow up with that. That's I mean, on. it's steeped in the victim mindset, right? Blaming women for things. See, the thing about it was, and this is kind of why I sort of exited the manosphere, if you if you want to call it that, and uh, you know, it, it is because the the original tenants were great, right? So I remember reading Rollo Tomasi's book, The Rational Male, and I was like, okay, this shit makes sense. But the one thing that I didn't like about it, I was like, it does feel a little jaded. So I remember doing my first book review on that. And I still have the video. And I was like, you know, this book is really, really good. It's got some really good fundamental truths that all men need to know. But just be careful not to get jaded. Like, take the advice in this book and take it objectively and don't form an emotional attachment to this advice, right? No one's doing anything to you. It just, it just is. Uh, one good example I use is, you know, if there's a tiger... All right. And it's in a cage. All right. And I stick my arm in the tiger cage and the tiger bites off my arm. Can I really be mad at the tiger? Am I really like the tiger fucked me up? Fuck this tiger. Right. And that's how women are. Right. We know the nature of women. Again, it's not a knock against women. We just yeah. know what women are capable of. Right. Men are capable of plenty of things as well. But it's like, you know this. And so there's all these men and they're taking this knowledge of what a woman can do. Uh, and and how some women behave and and kind of you know hypergamy and, and you know uh, female nature right they're taking this and they're treating it like the tiger just out of nowhere just bit off their arm no they stuck their arm in the cage right they, they took the risk they they understand what they're dealing with and so the whole point of of understand of, of understanding this is to understand how to operate not to have your feelings hurt by it right it, these mm -hmm. guys are getting angry at women and angry at society they're, they're 
it is such a fool's errand to think that you can change women or change society because it's yeah. unfair. Life yeah. is unfair. Like it's so dumb to try and change everyone else and the world instead of changing yourself, right? If I know, you know, the whole point of learning things as a man about women's nature is it's like before you understood those things, you're playing a game, right? We're all playing a game. We just didn't know what the rules were. So you're just moving the piece randomly and you're like, oh shit, why do I keep on losing? Now you know what the rules are. You might not like the rules. That's fine. But now you know what they are. Use those rules to your advantage so you can play the game and win. That's that's the whole thing that these guys should be should be understanding. And, you know, yeah, you could roll back society in 1950. You're still going to be a pussy, right? The whole point is that it doesn't make you less of a pussy if you roll back to 1950. The problem is not women. It's not society. It's you that you're a fucking pussy and you need to stop being a pussy, right? So that's why I get frustrated with these guys. I'm like, why do you want to go back to 1950? A lot of those guys were masculine men back then. So now you're going to be even more of a fucking pussy. There's so many pussy guys today. Like you have it easier in society than you ever have had it because if you could be a guy with balls uh, you're you're in the top 10 percent right there so there's no competition the, today yeah, there's exactly. way less competition yeah and and the thing about it too is like you, you go back to the 1950s thing right and it's like okay at that point women didn't really have a choice okay they had mm -hmm. to 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 latch themselves up to some loser guy okay because he had a job OK, do you really want a woman to stick with you because you have a fucking job? Like it's, it's so fucking pathetic to me. It's like in my mind, I want the woman that's with me to think this is the best fucking guy I could possibly get. Right. I'm fucking lucky to have this guy. Right. And it wouldn't matter if it's 1950 or 2050. It doesn't matter because if you're that guy and that's the only way I'm not accepting a woman that doesn't appreciate me in that way. And that's how these guys need to start thinking is stop thinking victim mindset and start thinking. I'm going to be so fucking good that any woman would be a fucking fool to not be with me. I, I'm not, I, she doesn't have to be with me because I make money and she can't get a job. That's fucking stupid. That to me, that is just pathetic. I would never ever want to be in a, in a situation, a relationship with a woman that's only with me because she doesn't have another choice. That's stupid. No, I, I feel you. You know, the reason I asked you this question, I'm actually reading this book by Douglas Gillette is called King lover, warrior magician. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, a good book. it's something like that. And at the beginning of the book, it mentions that um, he talks about he says that his claim. He claims that today we need more. We don't need less masculinity. That wasn't the problem. We need more masculinity. Right. It says that we're moving. Our culture is moving from a patriarchy to a matriarchy. And a patriarchy was not a masculine culture. He argued that patriarchy was ran by men who feared women, who wanted to control right. women, who wanted to control men and prevent men from actually achieving and becoming them best self. It was yep. all based on control. And, and, and relate that back to your 1950s comment about men. They want women to go back to when they didn't have, you know, those opportunities so that they could control them. And they basically kept them as a prisoner. Right. And um, and it's funny, you know, just that statement alone that um, Mr. Gillette made in his book, you can apply that to the red pill or the manosphere right now. What is yep. missing is more we need more masculinity we need more men who have that stoic uh that stoic personality um they have the, the, those stoic traits or they have those um i want to say the self-control or the um the wisdom that these uh, i guess ancient men or you know these types of men that we um we all aspire to and we talk about um i want to get into before let's, how long do i have you john you, more you, yeah 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 we can go a little bit longer if you if you need okay no i want to know i know that you just got married mm. i want to know who are you today compared to your first marriage who are you going into your first marriage compared to who you are today going into your marriage yeah yeah good question so um and, and just real quick to speak on what you just said because i think that's very very important okay. point about needing more masculinity and, and this idea if you look at even today like a good example is places like saudi arabia Right. Where there's a lot of people, in, including uh, Andrew Tate, to a degree, uh, a lot of guys that I think they're like they're saying, oh, yeah, these Arab guys, they got it figured out. They they're they're masculine men and they know how to discipline women into. Right. And what they don't I think what these guys are missing is that the reason why women are mistreated in Saudi Arabia like that in is because men are afraid is because they're trying to control because they they don't want to compete with other men on their merits. Mm -hmm. They want to say, hey, put stuff over your 
head, right? Don't yeah. touch other men. Don't go out of the house. Don't drive a car so that no man could possibly take you, right? Because I'm not, I, I can't, I don't feel like on my own, I can compete with these men. So I have to make it so that I have you under control, right? It's not your mm -hmm. choice to be with. And, and that's the weakness that, that so many yeah. guys are exhibiting today, but it, it's very, very true. And, and that's what's happening is in, with those guys that are, are, are wanting that in the red pill today is that I want it to be, go ahead and fucking compete with me. Let's, let's bring it on motherfucker. Let's, yeah. let's <laughs> like, like I know I'm the best. So yeah. let's, let's, because that, that breeds better men, right? We're yeah. supposed to compete against each other for women. That's how it's supposed to be. Right. Yeah. And, and that, and if you want to have a really good relationship, it needs to be based on that on that basis as well. So I feel you top dog mentality. I want to make I want to comment on that, because honestly, I've been thinking about I'm well, not thinking about it, but I've been just uh, I'm curious because this is the first time that women have had freedom, this kind of freedom, probably since the Stone Age, right. you know, where they had the freedom to because women have been controlled by a lot of our, our laws and our rules. Our social rules are based off of Christianity, Christianity and um, Muslim, all those different, all these more recent religions. But if you take a look at ancient religions like um, Greek, if you look at Greek mythology, for example, like in right. Western, in the Western world, we, we have our male archetype within religion is Jesus Christ. And right. then the female archetype is the Virgin Mary. So we expect our women to be virgins and we hold, you know, we basically, if, if they do sleep around their sluts and we basically demonize them. But if you take a look at uh, Greek mythology, they didn't do that. Women had various different archetypes. They had Athena. Whenever a woman's aggressive today, we automatically say that that woman is being masculine. But I don't think aggression is something that is, um, that is owned just by men. I think, that's, I think that's something that's misunderstood within our culture. I think women have the power to be assertive and aggressive just like men. And I think the Greeks understood that when they had the goddess athena and then they also had like um i think it's aphrodite they had other goddesses as well like goddess of love and things like that they understood that women came in all shapes and sizes you know and they gave women the opportunity to have um i want to say they had a having these archetypes allow women to really express that type of energy within themselves and we don't have anything like that in this world so i'm wondering how is the human culture, how is our society is going to evolve over time now that women have the freedom to choose, freedom to be free? How are men going to evolve? Is this going to make men more violent, angry? Are the strong masculine men going to have to wake up in culture and have to go back to protecting women and against these demonic dudes? It's, I just, it's, just, it's just curious. You, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think what it comes down to is that it's like one, one thing I've thought about a lot is that masculine is very defined right you're masculine or you're not there's not flavors of masculine right like a man is a man right you can tell if a man is a man yeah there's a lot more flavors of femininity right feminine is a little bit more amorphous and it's it's not it's not as clear right and so i think there's a lot of ways for women to be fem feminine now i do think that uh, that aggress well, I think it's all in the context, right? Because we all have masculine and feminine qualities within us, right? We can, yeah. you know, and I think if you look at the workforce, right, like the, the workplace, it's a masculine yeah. environment. And women that go into the workplace, they have to be masculine. They have to become yeah. masculine at that point. Now, now that is fine, right? Because there are times where you know men have to be feminine in nurturing a child, right? Taking care, of, you know, there's there's aspects yes. of that as well, but it's it's where your core is and it's in relation to each other right so men should should be masculine in front of women and in their relationships with women women should be feminine in their relationships with men they should be submissive and uh and 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 to be uh soft and 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 and, and not aggressive towards a man right now there is an aggressive feminine side right there's like there's there's like yeah. a dark side and and the light side of both the masculine and the feminine and aggression exist in both right so if you see like because believe me anyone who says that you know that uh, aggression is not a feminine trait is has never pissed off a woman because <laughs> <laughs> women can yell and fight like no fucking man could ever do yeah. okay yeah. so now is that a desirable trait in a woman though no, no because it is feminine but it's the dark side of the feminine right it, it is it's because 
it's really, again, if we were to look at masculine and the feminine, feminine is about emotion. It's about present moment in emotion. Masculine is about control, hardness, and, and really the, the stoic, you know, the stoicism. Right. And mm -hmm. so those, those are really the, the attributes. It's not like aggression or not aggression because yeah. those, those exist that, and especially emotion will bring out a lot of aggression. Now, I think a woman that is really in touch with her feminine and, uh, and the good side of the feminine is not going to use her emotion in an aggressive way. Right. Except for s specific circumstances, right. Her children being attacked, right. No, th th those type of things, the same with a man. So, but, but you yeah, made a, but that's a good point. you made a real good point when you said um, you're talking about aggressive women that they get loud, they're feisty, they fight. And you said that those women aren't attractive. And you said that's the dark side of um, femininity. And and reading that book that I was just talking about, I think that what that is, that's the mature, that's the immature femininity. You know, right. that's what that is. And I'm, I'm just curious because um, we, we, we only talk about there's so many different books on masculinity. We have philosophers that talked about this, but there's not many studies on um, the mature feminine, you know, right. the, um, I guess, yeah, the master feminine and whatnot. So just, just curious about that. Uh, back to my question around yeah. marriage. So you just got married again. Congratulations. Thank you. I want to know, cause I've been in relationships, man. And um, my journey's a little different. Let me give a little, some background on me. My journey's a little different, you know, and, um, it's a shame to say, but I was always like the the pretty boy growing up, and I was easy, it was pretty easy for me. So because of that, I had I had good women, I right. just didn't know it because I was I had options and I was immature about it, right? And um, it wasn't until I had a bad experience that I was like, okay, you know, I had a lot more respect right. for the women that that were nice to me, but I didn't know what I, didn't, I always thought that I could get better. I had no idea when guys would tell me their stories, I thought they were over exaggerating. Right. You know, until yeah. I um, until I experienced it. So, you know, what were you about to say? Oh, no, no. Go ahead. Oh, it's yeah, not like you're about to, OK, so you're about to say something. But um, my point is, is that I've evolved and I've changed from relationship to relationships. And I think your relationships help help you grow in many different ways. If you're willing to take on that journey, some people at the relationship ends, they get worse, some get better. I've always yeah. gotten better I, regardless of what the obstacle was. I've always gotten better. But I want to know who you were going into your first marriage compared to who you are going into this marriage. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, when I got married the first time I was 20 years old. Okay. Wow. I didn't really know anything about it. I didn't really have any experience with women. Uh, I had the victim mindset. I, I was, a, I was what, you know, what guys would call a blue pill simp type of guy, right? I was a pushover and uh, a people pleaser type of, of person, you know, definitely not very masculine and I actually got pressured into the marriage. Right. Uh, in in the eyes, you know, I, I basically said, okay, fine, I'll, I'll do it. You know, I, I had some reservations about how she treated me and stuff, but I, I said, you know, I still did it anyway. And I, and really for me, the relationship was, was extremely abusive, uh, emotionally abusive uh, to me right now. The, 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 the interesting thing about that is that, you know, a lot of guys don't, don't like this viewpoint, but a lot of, a huge percentage of how a woman is in a relationship is a reflection of the man that she's with. Right. And again, there are some attributes, obviously, you know, uh, with, with my ex-wife that I, that I know that are just her attributes, but some of it yeah, I'm responsible for, right. A, a large portion, at least the way that she treated me. And, and the, and the reason why I say that also is because you always have the option to walk as a man. Right. I was just talking to one of my friends who, you know, he, he had this thing, this girl that he's been dating for three years and, you know, she was screaming at him and yelling at him, like all kinds of stuff. And, and, you know, and there was a lot of stuff that went on and I was telling him, I was like, look, the thing is like a lesson from this. Cause after he just broke up there, I was like, the big lesson is this, it's like, you should have never tolerated it from the beginning. Right. So as soon as a woman yells at you, that's where you draw a boundary and you say, look, this, you, you don't talk to me like that. Right. You don't, you don't yell at me. And then, and she can do whatever she wants. She can say, fuck you, whatever. You just walk, use the most powerful weapon. You have your feet. Okay. And then, and then there's no power. No one can abuse you unless you let them abuse you. Right. So, so that's the thing that I didn't understand. Right. That's changed is that I didn't understand that 
it, that it, if you're being abused, it's your problem and it's your fault because you're choosing to allow it to happen with, with any relationship in your life, aside from someone literally holding you hostage and abusing you, right? But if you're in an abusive situation, you're, it's your fault because you're making that choice, okay, to be in that situation because you can leave at any time, right? Now, leaving is not always the easiest thing for people, but that it doesn't, it doesn't absolve you from the responsibility. And, and so and that's the whole thing is that, and, and here's the thing, right? Because if you're in a relationship with a woman, okay, and let's say it doesn't matter what kind of woman she is, let's say that she disrespects you, okay, and you draw a boundary, all right, and you say, hey, look, what you did is not cool. Like, you don't, I, nobody talks to me like that. You know, I don't appreciate that. Or, hey, yeah, you can't be be going and, and doing that. Like, going out with the girls when you're dating me is not cool. But whatever it is, whatever way that she disrespects you, you draw that boundary. There's a couple things that are going to happen. One, she's going to do it again or not care or, or tell you fuck off, in which case you just end it right there. Or number two, she's going to respect what you said and she's going to change her behavior. Either one is fine. OK, uh, so so either way, it's going to work itself out. Right. So either way, you're either not going to be in a relationship anymore or be seeing that person or you're going to have someone who is respecting you and is being trained to, you know, because, and the thing is you train people on how to treat you. That, that is a very important lesson that I learned in life. You teach people how to treat you and, uh, and you can train them good or bad, right? You know, and we, we know this in relationships that, that we're in, not even romantic relationships where we've trained people how to treat us. We train our friend group, how to treat us. If it's okay to rag on us to, you know, whatever, to, to, to borrow money and not pay it back. Like we train people how to treat us. And so that's, you know, that was my whole thing with my, with my first, uh, marriage is that, I, I kept on trying. She kept on apologizing. I kept on trying to like be perfect, trying to, you know, you know, figure out a way to like mm -hmm. to, to change her instead of, mm -hmm. instead of focusing on and, and what my actual real options were. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I don't know, you know, to some degree it would have happened one way or the other, either I would have left or she would have had to change to, to conform to my boundaries and respect my boundaries. Right. Um, but uh, what ended up happening, though, was I had a lot of growth through that through that relationship because since yeah. I was in that situation, I had to learn how to be stoic, right? Because I had to learn that you know I I I don't have control over the situation. I'm responsible for my own. I can't be responsible for this person's emotions. I have to be responsible for my own emotions and uh, and my own well being and take care of myself. And then you know at the end when I you know finally had enough, that's where I realized like look. I, I don't, I don't have to be here. I don't have to be in the situation. Like I'm never going to let someone disrespect me or treat me poorly again. And then yeah. when I got into the second relationship, I came in with that. Right. I mean, from the very beginning, right. Before you, when before I, you get into that though. Yeah. How long were you married? Uh, 19 years. Whoa, no, your, your first marriage. How long were you married? Yeah. 19 years. From 20 to 39. Yeah. So, tw Oh, wow. John. I yeah. didn't know it was that long, man. Yeah, I saw it, it was a long, a long time, long time. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. man. All right, so you can go into how you stepped yeah. into this one. But yeah, but no, when when I when I met my my current wife now, uh, you know, when I met her, I came in with the frame that I have lots of options. I'm not tolerating any kind of disrespect from anybody. Like if you if you don't treat me the way that I want to be treated, I'll just walk. I doesn't it doesn't matter. Like I have no problem walking. Right. And it's something that it doesn't need to be said. I never said that, but you can feel it. Right. You know, don't fuck with this guy. Right. And mm -hmm. I mean, and, you know, my current wife, she had a reputation of being mean, being mean to all of her exes and being like one of the first things her mom said when I met her was, has, has she been mean to you yet? And I was like, no, wow. she's never been mean. To, she never said one mean word to me at all. She's never raised her voice at me. She's never called me a name or anything. She's like, what? <laughs> right. Uh, but and that's what that's, that's my goes to my point of she knew absolutely that there was no way that I would tolerate it in the slightest. I would just be gone. Right. And I didn't yeah. need to say that. It's just how I carried myself and how I responded to things that she knew. You know, I, all I would say is I don't like this. And that should be enough. Like, I don't like this is the harshest rebuke that I should ever have to give anyone, right? Because yeah. that's because that's all I have to do. Because 
if I say that and someone persists, I can walk. That's you know. Again, now you're in a relationship, you're in a marriage. You're obviously not going to walk at the slightest. Yeah, you know, yeah. But yeah. but once you've set that precedent, that's how the relationship dynamic. Because whatever you set the relationship dynamic to be, that's how it stays. It does not change easily. And so since that dynamic is set, that's that's what it what it is. And um and and yeah, and, and you know she's wonderful. She she treats me uh, wonderful. Uh, treats me like a king. You know does just is is wonderful. But ne never still hasn't yelled at me hasn't said anything you know hasn't ever been really disrespectful to me at, at all right um and and so yeah so it's it's a total but but again that's why i say a lot of it is how is a reflection of who you are as a man right so you know if you're a weak man women will walk all over you and they will treat you bad and they will treat you know because the same woman the same woman you know she could be with one guy she can treat him like shit, yell at him, whatever, cheat on him, be with another guy. She worships the ground he walks on and, and wouldn't dare yet raise her voice at him. Right. The difference is not the woman. Not, not, not to say that there, there, there isn't qualities of, of women. Of course, a, a woman does have qualities that, you know, working on herself and, and, and things that, that she brings to the table. But women crave the leadership of a man. And especially in a relationship, they want you to set the example and to show them how to behave and give them the boundaries, right? You know, it's again, it's not a popular thing uh, for me to say. A lot of women get upset when I say that. A lot of guys get upset when I say that. They're like, oh, you're treating women like a child. It, it, it's, it is a little bit kind of like that. Like, it's not exactly like that, obviously, but... Yeah. But women want boundaries and they want to feel like they don't have to control things. They want a man to take charge and to take control and to take care of them and to to have clear boundaries because they don't want you to be weak and know that if they can run your ass over, then any fucking schmo can run your ass over or some other woman can just snatch you. And, you know, like they want to see that you have a backbone. You can control your 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 temper and uh, and and be kind. At the same time, like this is a this is the thing that that women are are testing for constantly. Man, do you how do you feel about sexual polarity? Is this a real thing? Because oh, yeah. you know, so it is a real thing. Yeah. So what is what does David Data mean by some women can be hot, some women can be cold? Because the way that I read that was hot was more masculine, cold was more feminine. But obviously, I'm incorrect. I think just through this conversation, I feel like I may be incorrect about. About my idea around the masculinity, the femininity, and the submission that comes along with that. Because you said women, all women are made to submit. So what do you think mm -hmm. he what what does it mean when it says sex? What does sexual polarity really mean? What does it mean to you? I, I think, well, okay, so sexual polarity itself is the masculine and, and the and the feminine, right? Two opposites of the pole. It's it's the same thing. I think a good way to think about this also is ma magnetic induction. Right. You're familiar with the concept of magnetic induction. Like if you have a stronger magnet, right, you hold it up to a weaker magnet and it'll switch poles. No, I've never uh I'm, I'm I get the concept behind it, but I have not heard that. What is it called? I'm gonna type that out real fast. Magnetic yeah. induction. So if I have a really, really strong magnet that's a north pole, right? And I take it and I put it up against another north pole magnet, okay, and that's a weaker magnet. It will switch poles. The north will become south. Uh, magnet. You'll induce uh, magnetism in the other uh, in magnet. Now, that's how I view a lot of the sexual dynamics with men and women. Is that if you're a very strong masculine man, because we have these women today, right, in society that are masculine women, right? They're feminists. Okay, they're a lot of them hate men, right? They're you know very much dominant and and they they want to be men. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because you take one of those women that's hardcore feminist, whatever that says, you know, I'm the same as you men and women are, are the same, whatever, whatever kind of bullshit that she wants to spew. And if you're a dominant masculine man in her presence, she's going to become feminine for you. That's, that's the power of, of that, of that uh, sexual polarity because you will force the pole to switch. OK, mm -hmm. now, if you have a woman that's already very feminine and you're very masculine, you're going to have a huge amount of sexual chemistry. But you have to have that in order to have sexual chemistry. If you have a, a masculine woman uh, it's, and, and you're masculine, it's not going to you're going to be fighting. You're going to be in a constant battle with this person. Yeah. Right? That's why women have to submit to a man. But the thing is, submitting is a willing 
thing, right? I think a lot of guys think they can force a person to submit, right? It has to be something where a woman says she values your leadership. She trusts you. She says, I want to submit to this guy. I want him to, uh, to tell me what to do essentially. Right. He, I want him, I want to follow him. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that is what, what creates that, that polarity, but, uh, but that polarity has to exist in order for a relation. And, and what happens a lot of times, right? This is where you see this happen with, with, especially with married guys is that they will try and make their woman into a man. How do they do that? Right. What happens is that, okay. Woman is being illogical. She's yelling, complaining, being very emotional. And they're like, honey, like that doesn't stop it. Like stop carrying on, stop feeling this way. You need to like, they try to explain a lot. They try to make her into a man and yeah. it's killing that, that sexual, that polarity. Right. Uh, instead, as a man, you have to realize that a woman is an emotional being and embrace that and validate the emotions that she feels. Women need to vent. Right. Men want logic. Women, when a woman is acting up, when she's yelling, when she's whatever, she's emotional, almost almost 100 percent of the time, it's because she doesn't feel loved. And that's the thing that you need to do right is mm -hmm. is is accept her emotion again it doesn't mean that you tolerate disrespect it doesn't mean that someone's you know calling you fuck you to your face and, and whatever i hate you whatever that you just like you know that you just yeah. tolerate that <laughs> hopefully it should never ever get to that level because you should have already set the groundwork in that relationship from the beginning where mm -hmm. that stuff wouldn't even s like it, you, she would dare do that because she knows that you're be gone right but um, but, but yeah, but, but the thing is that women need to vent and, and men try to make women to be men like their buddies to be logical. And a lot of times they succeed. And when they succeed, they kill the sexual, uh, polarity. And that's where you have dead uh, marriages with dead bedrooms where, where you don't have sex anymore. Understood. Um, before we go off, I want to. I want to plug your, um, well, that never runs dry. Can you talk about that briefly? Um, what it entails, what it delivers, and um, yeah, what you can get from it, basically. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I put together a, a financial freedom program because so many people wanted to, uh, you know, to do what I've done, right? To, to be able to become financially free through investing in real estate and, uh, and building up their business and, and building like, you know, a, a following on YouTube or social media and, or blog or whatever it is. And to be able to have that, that passive income from that. So I put together, uh, kind of my plan, uh, the, the entire plan of exactly what I, what I did and, and what I've been coaching people for, you know, guys for 10 years on becoming financially free, but you know, my most successful coaching client, he, he did like $3 million in revenue last year. And we started, you know, his business from scratch, but I took all, took all that and put that into a program, um, where I do weekly group coaching calls. So you're personally mentored by me on, on those group coaching calls. And you've got a lot of other entrepreneurs and you know guys that are trying to uh, really have the same kind of mindset. They want to become financially free all together um, in, in that program. So it's called the well that never runs dry. Uh, I don't know if I have a good link here for it. Maybe I can send you a link, but if you're, if you message me on Instagram, if you DM me, uh, you know, we'll, we can get, get to you on that. And then let me see if I do have a link here. Okay. Yeah. Let me give you a link. So if you go to bulldogmindset.com, I'll drop it in the, in the comments or in the chat here as well. Or I guess I can't do it in the comments, but I'll put it in the private chat here. It's uh, bulldogmindset.com forward slash well dash app. And then you can, you can apply to be in the program there. Did you? Oh, okay. There goes in private chat. All right. Yeah. Cool. Got it. Um, all right. Yeah. John, uh, thank you for being here, man. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Honestly, as somebody, you're somebody I admired for years, man. You know, and I like to see your evolution. I remember when you were sitting on your desk, you had your glasses on, you had your <laughs> little, uh, like you was talking like, yeah, the, the tone of voice, everything was different for what it is yeah. right now, man. So um, I'm, I'm happy with your evolution. I look forward to making some money with you too. You know, I'll talk awesome. to you about that a little bit later. All right. But yeah, thank you. All right. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Have a good one.